welcome. We've been navigating through a series, a faith-fueled journey over the life of Abraham. As I mentioned, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 19 this morning. If you haven't found your way there, please do so at this point in time. Genesis chapter 19. And I just want to ask the question as we jump into this this morning. Have you ever asked yourself, how did I end up here? Ever been there? Maybe you went out on a hike. Maybe you thought you knew where you were going. A a couple of months ago, actually almost a year ago now, my wife and my family, we went up for a little bit of a hike up country. I thought I knew I was going. There was still snow on the ground. We started trekking through. We ended up in a location. And finally, I asked myself, how did we end up here? It was just a baffling question. Maybe you've been driving someplace before. And you've been driving along. You think you know the area. Or maybe it's new to you. You end up realizing, man, we are a half an hour from the destination. Maybe an hour from the destination. And you ask yourself, how did I end up up here. Any guys ever do that here? Okay, honestly, how many wives have been with a guy who did that? Let's just be honest. There you go. I knew that we'd get some honesty here. We've been there in life where we ask ourselves the question, how in the world did I end up here? And those are simple things. But maybe there's other things going on in our lives that we end up having these moments that's not just about a destination of where I'm going to walk or where I'm going to drive to. It's how did I end up here in my marriage? How did I end up here in my second marriage? How did I end up here in this relationship? How did I end up here in a job? How did I end up here with my finances? And the story that we're going to read through today and walk through this morning is a story that it's that question. How did this guy and his family end up here? How did this happen? This seems so crazy. And what we are about to read, I'm going to just be honest with you. If you didn't know that this was in the Bible, if you've never read this for yourself and somebody told you, hey, you want to hear this story about Lot and what happens at the end of his life? At the end of it, you would say, there's no way that that is in the Bible. And it is in the Bible. It is a crazy story. If it was a movie, it would be rated R. I'm going to clean it up a little bit for us today. We're going we're gonna to walk through. And here's the thing. Uh, this week, I was talking to my wife. My wife's like, you're going to talk about that at church? I'm like, yes. You want to know why? Because this is what I firmly believe. If the God who created the heavens and earth wrote this word for us, there's a reason that everything is written in there. And if he says, I want to put that story in there, there's a reason for us in the 21st century to grab a hold of it, learn from it. It's going to teach us. It's going to change our lives. And maybe for some of us, my heart today, if I can be really upfront with you, I believe that I have four jobs as a pastor. The first one is to feed you. Not regular food. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about from the word of God. We're going to teach this every single week. We're going to give you the scriptures and talk about God's word that you walk away hopefully well fed from the call church. The second thing that is my responsibility as a pastor is to lead you. I've got to set the example in my own life. It's not good enough for me to tell you what to do. I need to be living that for myself. The third thing is to care for you as a shepherd cares for sheep. That's the scriptural mandate for a pastor to do. And the fourth thing is what I want to do with you today. Protect you. I want to protect you because there are some things that we are going to read about that you would say, how did that guy get there? And if we are not careful, if we are not careful, we will find ourselves in a similar situation. So turn to your neighbor right now and just tell him, this is going to be really good. Just tell him that. This is going to be really good. And I got to be honest, I'm excited to talk to you about a story that nobody likes to talk about in church. Genesis chapter 19. Let me give you the, the, the runway of what's been going on. We've been talking about a guy by the name of Abraham. Abraham gets called by God to leave his country, to leave his people, to leave his father's household, and to go to a land that God is calling him to go to. And Abraham in faith trusts the Lord. It's an incredible moment back in Genesis chapter 12 is where we started this journey. And on the way, there's a famine in the land. So he, he heads down to Egypt. He lies about his wife. He gets into a little bit of a circumstance and some trouble. He finally gets back on board, heads back to where God's calling him to be. And he's got his nephew Lot with him, which he's had with him the entire time. They're growing. God is blessing them. Abraham's faith is really, I think, what is blessing both he and Lot and their family. And, and they get to a point where we can't sustain ourselves. You've got to go one way and I've got to go another. And Lot chooses a way that we talked about that was green. It was great. It was next to a city called Sodom. And Abraham goes another direction. Lot ends up going there and he finds himself living in the city. Abraham starts to make some decisions that aren't so great. He tries to shortcut God's plan. He ends up having a relationship with a maidservant of his wife trying to produce a child because God had promised them that they were going to have a promised child together. And over the course of this, we've seen Abraham doesn't do everything right. He certainly does not. But he is a man of faith, walking with God, calling upon God, seeking to live a life that pleases God. 
And in the midst of this, where we see Lot has some situations, Abraham has a moment where he goes and rescues Lot because he is taken by some, some kings. They, they overrun Sodom. And, and then last, last week, we've been dialoguing through the, the consequences of what happened and transpired for Sodom. That God sends wrath, destroys the city, and saves a couple of people. Lot, Abraham's nephew, and his two daughters. And if you didn't remember, his wife, Lot's wife, was leaving the city as well. But she, she ends up dying there because she has this draw back to this city. And today, we talk about the concluding story of Lot's life. And I just want to let you know up front, it is not a fairy tale ending. It is not a moment that you go, man, I wish I have, I hope I have that kind of a story at the end of my days. It's a story that we go, how on earth did he get there? And I want to spend some time talking to us about how we don't get there. Genesis chapter 19, starting at verse 30, and this is what God's word says. Lot and his two daughters left Zoar. Remember, they had fled from Sodom under the angel's command, get out of this place, God is going to destroy it, and they had been living in Zoar. And they settled in the mountains, for he was afraid to stay at Zoar. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. One day the older daughter said to the younger, Our father is old and there is no man around here to give us children, as is the custom all over the earth. Let's get our father to drink wine and then sleep with him and preserve our family line through our father. That night they got their father to drink wine and the older daughter went in and slept with him. He was not aware of it and when she lay down or when she got up. The next day, the older daughter said to the younger, last night I slept with my father. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight so that you can go in and sleep with him so we can preserve our family line through our father. So they got their father to drink wine the night also, and the younger daughter went in and slept with him. Again, he was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son, and she named him Moab. He's the father of the Moabites today. The younger daughter also had a son and named him Ben-Ami, and he is father of the Ammonites of today. Let me pray for us. God, I trust your word, and I trust that you are infinitely wiser than we are. And there is definitely a reason why this passage is sitting here, even for us to talk about this day. It is of no surprise to you, each person that is sitting in this room. And so, Father, I ask in a way that you only can, that your spirit would speak into our hearts and to our lives, that you would bring your word to life. Not just something that we say we spent some time at church, we went through the motions, we sang some songs. But, God, that today would be a life-changing moment, that for some of us, it would propel us down a different path and a different avenue, that we would walk in obedience to you. And God, that we would learn from Lot's life, maybe the things of what not to do, so that we don't make the same decisions and the same choices. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I mentioned, it's a story that maybe for some of you, you read that and go, I cannot believe that's in the Bible. That's why I want to encourage you. you got to read the Bible. There is stuff in here that you're like, I can't believe that is in the Bible. I say this all the time, general hospital days of our lives, they got nothing on God's word. He's been telling this stuff for a long time. And he puts it there to teach us some valuable lessons. And I want to talk to you about today about the decisions before the decisions. Because we see the decision here. Lot's daughters make a decision to sleep with their dad. They have relations with him. Get him drunk. And ultimately have two children through their father. Disgusting stuff. Sinful stuff. We can all look at that. And most of us in this room right now would say, I would never do that. But I want to talk to you about the decisions really before the decisions. And some things that you can do to make a difference in your life that you don't end up here. The first decision is this. To be wise, I won't compromise. Would you just say that with me? To be wise, I won't compromise. Say that like you really mean it. To be wise, I won't compromise. Because there's a story before the story. You see, when we were talking about the whole hiking illustration or we were talking about the whole driving illustration and you ask yourself the question, how did I end up here? The reality of that is you made some decisions before you got there. You made some choices along the way. 
Maybe you went left when you should have went right. Maybe you went straight when you should have turned around. It doesn't matter. The reality is the decisions that you made, and would anybody agree this morning that you've made some decisions in your life that haven't been the greatest? Here's the bottom line to that. You know who came up with those decisions? You did. You did it all by yourself. Great job. And the the reality is we've made small decisions that ultimately lead us to a place when we ask ourselves, how did I get here? So the question then becomes, how do I stop from making decisions way back here that lead me to a place that I don't want to be? And what I would encourage you, let us learn the lessons from Lot's life. Be wise. Don't compromise. That should be part of our nature of I'm not going to compromise in this area. Look at the story before the story. If we go back, it says this in, in the passages before Two men parted company. Abraham lived in the land of Canaan while Lot lived among the cities and the plains and pitched his tent near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. We talked about this several weeks ago. Lot's initial decision to go, I want to go to that land. And he goes and he pitches his tents near Sodom. Did you catch that? He's outside the city, but the city is tremendously wicked. In just a chapter or two later, verse 12 of chapter 14, they also carried off Lot's nephew and his possessions. And now we find, what is he doing? He is living in Sodom. Do you see the small compromise? I'm going to be next to a place. And the next time we find him, he's not next to it anymore. He's in it. And then what we talked about last week, the two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. Now he's a leader. He's part of the community. He's probably one of the respected people of the town. And you see the small decisions and the small compromises, just a little bit that got him into trouble. Do you guys see that? I want to illustrate something for you this morning. And uh, there was a father, and his children came to him. And uh, he had two teenage boys. And the teenage boys came and they said, hey, dad, I want to let you know. We want to let you know we're going to ask you a favor. The household was a pretty strict household. And they said, dad, we we really want to go see this movie. And we want to just preface it by saying this. It's rated R. And we know you've got some standards on rated R. But we've heard about this. And it's just a little bit of nudity, just a little bit of nudity in there. And there's, just, uh, there's a, probably a lot of swearing. There's, there's a little bit of, of violence. There's some inappropriate, certainly inappropriate jokes, but it's rated R. And I want to let you know, Dad, too, that some of our Christian friends at church have already gone and seen it, and their parents allowed them to do it. And the father's having this conversation with his boys, and as they're talking about it, he finally says, you know what, kids, I just got to be honest. No. The answer, you know my standards on this. No. Well, they got all huffy, and they got all puffy, and they headed downstairs. He says, if you want to invite your friends over, you can watch one of the movies that we've got here. It's fine. So the friends were, no, we're, we're going downstairs. And so they got down there, and the, the dad was sitting there thinking, going, how do I communicate what I'm really feeling and, and conv- convince them that this is really important? And so he decided to bake them some brownies. And uh, I'm not a pioneer woman, nor am I a pioneer man, but I'm just going to do this this morning with you. Hopefully this will work. And he he got some brownie mix, right? He poured out the brownie mix in there, and he's making it. And then uh, a little bit later, get some water, you know, because you guys all know brownies. You got to have some water in that. He ends up thinking, I want to make it really, really good for them. So he, he gets some walnuts, because who doesn't like walnuts in their brownies, right? Nobody? Okay, well, these kids liked walnuts and their brownies. And then he's like, what kid doesn't like chocolate? It's already chocolate anyway. We're going to dump in just a bunch of chocolate chips on that too. And obviously we know we got to have some vegetable oil in there. And the reality is usually you put one more ingredient in there. There's eggs, right? And I, don't, I didn't want to do that this morning. That would be a total mess up here. And so he starts mixing it up. And he gets it all ready to go. And it's all looking good and looking nice And he's like, but there's one more ingredient that I got to get. And he heads outside. He has a small bag in his hand. And he heads outside out to the the yard. And he comes back. And they've got a dog in the house. And he pulls up a, a little chunk of what he found in the yard. Breaks that up. Tosses that in there. Whips it up real good for the kids. Then he throws it in the oven. 
He starts cooking it. Well, the boy's downstairs. Oh, dad's cooking brownies. He probably feels bad that he's being such a jerk and such a stiff, and he's going to come down here. And maybe if we're good and we can really coax him and really butter him up, maybe he'll let us go to the film. And so the brownie is just filling the air. The kids are just so excited. Oh, man, we're going to eat brownies. Dad waits, cools him off just a little bit, cuts some big old plate, walks downstairs with him, says, hey, boys. I just wanted to make you some brownies. Both of them, uh oh, hands and fists, and they're grabbing it. And they're about to eat. He goes, wait, 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 wait. I made these brownies just for you guys. But here's the deal. I added just a little bit, just a little bit of one ingredient. The boys are like, well, what is it? They're wanting to put it in their mouth so bad. He goes, well, I had to go outside. It's filled with the best ingredients, though. It's got brownie, it's got, it's got walnut, it's got, it's got chocolate chips. Oh, you guys are going to love it. And it's got just a little bit of dog poop in it. <laughs> do you guys want to eat it? And of course, what do the boys say? What? They threw it back on the plate. And the point is pretty simple, right? Just a little bit of compromise. Just a little bit of compromise. I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're like, wait a minute. I've been to a dessert night at Brian and Rachel's house. <laughs> and I just want to let you know in total honesty, I don't bake the desserts or do. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. But can I say this? If you don't want a little bit of dog poop in your brownie, why would you want a little bit of poop in your life? That sounded a whole lot better when I was saying it in my mind. But do you get the point that we make small compromises that are not God's standards and we bring it into our lives and we act like it's not that big of a deal? I've been enforcing this truth in my kid's life. My kids have heard this illustration so many times. Every time they come and ask me, but dad, it's just a little like, you want some brownies? You know, it's just like every time I'm saying this to you so you get it because Lot's life led to this place. And it wasn't just one moment. We don't find ourselves making decisions like that all of a sudden out of the blue willy-nilly. It doesn't happen that way. It's usually a series of small little compromises. Can I give you some examples? Alcohol. Oh, it's just a little bit more than I should have, which leads to a little bit more than you should have next time and a little bit more than you should have the following time. And before you know it, every night that is your means of relaxation Every time you're around somebody, you can't get a drink out of your hand. And if you want to be honest, for some of us in here, I'm just lovingly going to say this because I want to protect you and I care about you. You're a functioning alcoholic because you've made small compromises in your life. Sexually speaking, oh, it's just a little bit of whatever. on the, And it's not really pornography. It's close, but, you know, it's just some ladies looking pretty risque, whatever it may be. And before you know it, all of a sudden you're tuning into something else. And before you know it, you're doing things that you never thought you would do because you put a little poop in your life and you allowed it to sit there and you didn't deal with it and you permitted it. Is this making sense right now? Because this is super important to me. Because I want want the best life for you. And do you believe that God wants the best life for you too? I believe wholeheartedly that he does. Stop putting poop in your brownies, people. So, (laughs) All right, if you guys want some chocolate chips afterwards, help yourselves. So (laughs) there's plenty of batter up there for you. Help yourself. I'm not touching that. So anyway, I want to give you two quick things. Two quick things that will that where we make these kind of compromises in our life. One, compromising people. Would you say that with me? Compromising people. If you remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, which we talked about last week, they, th- these guys are in the city. They want to rape these men that have come into the city, the whole town, young and old. And listen to what it says. Before they had gone to bed, these angels are staying at Lot's house. All the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called out to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them, and he shut the door behind him, and he said, and if you're not careful, you don't catch this. Know what? Know my friends. Do you catch it? It's this dynamic of the people that we end up hanging around with have an influence on our lives. These are the people that Lot is saying, you are my buddies. You're my closest companions. You are the people in my life that I spend the most time with. And you think that that doesn't wear off on you? 
Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts what? Good morals. Can I ask you this question today? Who are you surrounding yourself with? Who are the people in your life that you spend the most time with? Because I know what most of us in this room will say, well, I'll never be like them. Can I ask you this question? If you became like them, would you be a better person? Is it your desire to be like them in your life? And if the bulk of your people that you're around, you say, not really, you might want to think of some new people to start hanging out with. Righteous people think differently. We can talk through all sorts of Proverbs, right? There's, there's a ton of them. The standpoint of, you know, he who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. We know that. The old saying, right, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. This, this aspect of who we hang out with, young people, I want to encourage you, make it in a priority of the people that you spend your time with because it's going to have an influence in your life. Lot was influenced by the people that he was around. The second thing is this, compromising practices. Compromising practices. Look at what he says next in chapter 19, and I know we're, we're leading up to the story we're talking about. Look, this is what Lot says. I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you. And you can do whatever you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my, my roof. Any of you ladies here saying, that's the kind of dad I want. <laughs> oh, man, I missed out. What on earth happened to this guy? What happened from a guy who was with Abraham, who was seeking after the Lord, to lead him to the place of, man, you guys want to come and rape these guys? Here, take my daughters instead, who are two virgins. Do with them whatever you want. Dad of the Year Award's not going to this guy. Because he's, he's in an environment where practices are, are leading him astray. My father used to have an old saying. He said it to me all the time. My dad was a health nut. Um, when I got uh, into high school, we ate, remember when oat bran became pop popular? That is all we ate in our house. We had oat bran waffles, oat bran cereal, oat bran, everything was oat bran. That was my dad's kick. You want to know why? Because he had a heart attack, and then later he said these words. He said it to me, he bedded it in my head. Brian, garbage in. You guys know it. And when I permit myself to be around practices that are not honoring to the Lord, when I'm thinking about practices that are not honoring to the Lord, guess what's going to be the product of my life? Practices that aren't typically honoring to the Lord. Galatians 6, 7, and 8, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man or woman will reap what they sow. The one who sows to, the one who sows to please the flesh from that flesh will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the spirit from that spirit will reap destruction eternal life. Can I ask you this question? Your practices today, what are you sowing? Because our, our actions are going to yield a, a product, a harvest. What is it that they're going to yield? If, if you're honest, it's going to reap good, good relationships. If you're a liar, it's going to reap broken relationships. And God's not going to be mocked through that. And so we get to these places of, and I just ask the question, are you compromising? Are you compromising in your relationship? Are you compromising in certain practices? Well, it's just a little bit of drugs, Brian. I just get high every once in a while. I'm just around people that are doing drugs. I get a contact. It's not really, it's just a little bit of pot. I'm not really drunk. I'm just not really in control. That's probably not what God calls us to do. It's just a little bit of flirting with my coworker. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, it's all harmless until you're giving your coworker a ride home, until you step in the doors, until all of a sudden those small compromises catch up to you and you've committed adultery and you go, how did I get here? And I can guarantee you how you got there. You made small compromises in the past that leads to this point. It's just Facebook. It's just some things and the old flame from high school. My wife doesn't need to know about it. My husband doesn't need to know about it. Can I tell you something? If you're doing it in secret, there's probably a reason you're doing it in secret. And maybe you shouldn't be doing it. Pornography. Your business practices. Are you honest? Are you a person of integrity? Because it'll lead you to a place that you don't want to be if you're not. And not only those things. How about the things that we should be doing that we don't? Praying. I don't need to pray. I used to pray, but I don't pray anymore. And that old saying, prayer will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from prayer. 
Reading the Bible. Yeah, the Bible. I don't read it very much anymore. I know as a Christian, I probably should so I could know God's word and how he wants me to live, but I haven't been doing it. And that old statement, right, of if you have a Bible that's falling apart, you usually have a life that isn't. Church, I don't go to church. I, 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 I don't need it. I mean, Brian, I don't really need it. I don't need to go to church to have a relationship with God. And you know the old saying, go to church, don't be a jerk. No, I don't know. I just made that up. So <laughs> go to church. Make it a priority to be around people and around community because it leads us down a road. The, the, the second thing, the second decision before a decision is this. I'll congregate, not isolate. I'll congregate, not isolate. I want you to notice what ends up happening here. So Sodom is destroyed, the place where Lot lived. And then it says these words, he headed out to Zor, and he, but then Lot and his two daughters settled into the mountains. They left Zor because they were afraid to stay in Zor. And he and his two daughters lived where? In a cave. I mean, how barbaric do you have to be? You were just once in a city, and now you go and you isolate. Can I ask you this question? Did it ever dawn on you, why doesn't Lot go back to where he started? Why didn't he go find Abraham? Man, this was the guy who, when I was with him, my life was blessed. He's a guy who's pursuing God. God seems to be pouring out blessing upon blessing upon his life. And Lot, instead of going, hey, girls, we should go back to where we were. We don't have all the problems. That we've done. Everything that we've got is lost. We, don't, we, we can go back. And, and can I tell you why I think he didn't do that? Because of shame? Because of his own pride? Because he gets to a place where it's like, if I go back there, I've lost everything. I lost my wife. I lost all my possessions. I've lost it all because it's based upon my choices and my decisions. And instead of owning that, I'm going to go isolate and find myself up in a cave. And I say this to a lot of people all the time. You know the animals that get plucked off on the nature channel? They're the ones that are what? By themselves. They're the ones who are alone. Look at the gazelle. Look at it eating the... And it's not paying attention to the cheetah, right? And you always see that. And it's by itself and boom. And it's where we make terrible decisions a lot of times is by ourselves. They got there and experienced shame. I, I, I know this because I'm going to say this to us. Some of us feel like we're in community with people. You would say that. You're in church. Some of you are in small group. Some of you would say, I've, I've got relationships around me. And, and you do the right things, but you're not really in community. You're still living in a cave. I remember I got serious about my relationship with the Lord at about the age of 19. I grew up in a Christian home, many of you know that. And as I got serious about my relationship with God, I started to meet with a group of guys on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, to challenge us to read God's word, to pray regularly, to seek after him. And so I started to do that. And I had this sin in my life that very few people knew about. And I won't get into the details of what that was. I've shared that in the past here. So, um, and I started to, to, to really feel some deep conviction about it. I was living in community, trying to do life with these guys, trying to push each other and allow them to push me. To, but, but I wasn't really being honest about what was going on in my life. And finally, one day, I had had it. I said, I don't care what anybody thinks about me anymore. I don't care what you think about me anymore. This is an area of my life that I don't want to be dealing with any longer, so I need you guys to pray for me. I need you guys to hold me accountable to this. And I just threw it out there to these guys. And you know what happened? When it got into the light, things started to change in my life because I started to experience community, and I started to have victory over an area of my life that I didn't have victory over before. And some of us, if I can lovingly say this, you are living in community, but you're really living in a cave. You come and you pray, you play the part. Hey, you walk into church, Jesus is so amazing. And you walk out and there is so much junk going on in your life that you have never been honest about. And it's going to lead you down a road that we're going to talk about in a minute to the potential of some decisions in your life that will wreck you. Why do you want to shipwreck your life? Why not be honest? Hey, I'm struggling with alcohol. I want you guys to pray for me. Maybe it's time to get involved into a small group. Maybe it's time to start being a part of a church. Maybe it's time to, it's time to get away from some relationships and start making the, the relationships that are going to propel you to the place where you want to be and stop isolating Finding those places, Proverbs 28, 13 says this, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. You want to know why most of us find ourselves in a cave? Because we'd be embarrassed if people found out the decisions that were really going on in our lives. You guys know who Jeff Foxworthy is? You might be a redneck. You might be making a bad decision if you'd be embarrassed if other people found out that you were doing it. Why not just say, you know what? 
And what do you think about this decision? A lot of my decisions that I make, especially here at the church, I run through a board of people, people that I trust, because I'm fallible and I make mistakes. And to get to that spot of, talk to me, am I making a wise decision here? Don't get in isolation. Find yourself in community. And I just ask you this question, are you living in community or are you really living in a cave today? Is this a spot where you're honest with people? That you're saying, I don't care what you think about the decisions I make. I want to hear that back from you. And if I'm about to make a dumb one, tell me. Because I want the life God has for me, not the one that I want to create for myself. I want to conclude by just giving you two final points here. Number one is compromise and sin always has a ripple effect. Compromise and sin always has a ripple effect. You guys, if we go to this uh, next picture, and I know the verse is up there, but uh, you guys know what that looks like, right? You drop a, a, a rock into the pond or into the lake or into a glass, whatever it may be, you see that ripple effect. And that's really what sin and compromise does. It doesn't just impact you. It impacts a multitude of people. Look what happens. So one day, the older daughter said to the younger, I've got a great idea. Our father's old, and there's no man around us here to give us children. So let's get our father to drink wine, and then we'll sleep with him and preserve our family line through our father. That night, they got their father to drink wine, and the older daughter went in and slept with him. He was not aware of it when she lay down or where she got up. And then we see the same thing happens again. Where did this type of thinking originate from? Where did it start? Back in Sodom. When they saw all the sexual perversion, I wonder how many conversations they were having with people that they were around. Oh, this is what we do. This is what we do. This is what's permissible in our home. Because it always has a ripple effect. Lot took his family there and kept them there and didn't say, hey, we got to get out of this place because this is not a healthy environment for us to be. And that had an impact not on just his life, but on his kid's life and his grandkid's life. And for generations to come. You and I don't sin in a vacuum. It just doesn't happen that way. I remember being invited to a Super Bowl party about 12 years ago. It was not at this church, so um, just to clarify that. A guy from a previous church, his name was Bob. Bob says, hey, you want to come to a Super Bowl party with me? I was like, okay, sure. We go down to the, his house and we're watching the Super Bowl. And back then, I think things have changed a little bit, but back then, the Super Bowl commercials were, were pretty raunchy. It was a thing that if you were in youth ministry, it was like, you can show the Super Bowl, but don't show the ads because these kids are seeing stuff that they shouldn't see. And as we were standing there, this advertisement came up with a, a situation with a gal, and it was so, I was, I was embarrassed. I was like, this, I, I, I can't even look. And I remember turning my head because I was like, this is humiliating that I'm standing here watching this. I turned my head, and Bob is standing there glued to the TV. And his son, who's about 16, 17 years old, glued to the TV. And I'm kind of watching them going, hmm, that's not good. And the commercial gets over, and I'll never forget it. The son looks at his dad. He says, hey, dad, did you get that recorded? And the father turns to his son and says, I did. We'll watch back later. He's divorced. Surprise. Do you think that has an impact on his son? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because sin always has a ripple effect. It impacts people around us. And I want to talk to you parents for just a moment. Because what you are doing and the compromises, if you are compromising, or the sin, if you are sinning, or the life that you are saying, I'm living this for the Lord, it has a ripple and a trickle-down effect on your kids. And are we setting the tone that we want for our children? If you want your kids to be godly, then we should be godly. If you want your kids to live a certain way, then we should be living that certain way because your kid, more is, you all know the saying, more is caught than what? Taught. It's just your kids are watching you. And I love what Chuck Swindoll said. He said these words, the church cannot resurrect what the home puts to death. Us bringing our kids to church is not gonna change what we're teaching our kids in our home life. And I really wanna encourage you as a parent today, be an individual that your kids look to and go, man, I respect that because our decisions have a ripple and a trickle-down effect. The last thing is this. My decisions write the pages of my legacy. You're in my decisions write the pages of our legacy. It's fascinating at the end of this. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son. 
She named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites today. The younger daughter had a son also, and she named him Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites today. And that's where Lot's story ends. How many of you want that at the end of your story? No, right? That that's how you go out. It doesn't say anything about his death. doesn't say anything about the good that he did. doesn't say this is his final story in the book of Genesis. And it's interesting that the Bible points out what the names of these kids are. Names meant something back then in the standpoint of it reflected character or how the kids came about. If you guys remember the story of Esau when Esau is born, Esau means hairy, right? So he probably came out looking like a billy goat. I have no idea what he looked like. And they're like, oh, that's Esau, right? Jacob was born next, and he was grabbing Esau's ankle. Jacob means one who grabs the heel. It actually signified what these kids were, something about them. Figuratively, Jacob meant deceiver. When they talk about Isaac, we just talked about this a couple weeks ago, when God said to Abraham, Abraham, you're going to have a son through Sarah. You're going to name him Isaac, which meant, if you remember, laughter. Why do you think God did it that way? Because later when somebody's like, what's your name? My name's Isaac. Isaac, it's laughter. Why did your parents name you that? Well, my parents named me that because my dad was 100 and my mom was 90 when they had me. That's funny. God played a trick on them, right? I mean, that's why... It it signified something. Do you know what the name Moab means? From father. And do you know what the name Ben Amin means? From a kinsman. Stop and think about this for a moment. What's your name? Moab. Oh, I've never heard of a kid named Moab. That means from father. What, What does that mean? Well, my dad, my dad's my grandpa. I, I mean... Can you imagine that story? And your brother's name, Ben Ami, what, that's weird from a kinsman? Yeah, same thing. My aunt slept with her dad who had us. That's Lot's legacy. That's what he left with. And I just ask you this question, what do you want to be remembered by? What is it? I, and I guarantee this. Lot didn't start this journey with Abraham and say, you know what I really want in my life? I want to choose a different direction than Abraham, find myself living next to a city, ultimately living in the city, getting raided and being captured and then being rescued, coming back to that city, becoming a city official there. And then all of a sudden, God sends some angels. And in the process of that, I offer my daughters up to be raped as we're leaving because God's going to destroy the city. My wife turns back. She turns into a pillar of salt. And then I end up living out the rest of my days in a cave with my two daughters who I ultimately sleep with so that they have a child through me. Nobody starts their dreams that way. Nobody. But that's what it ends with when we don't align ourselves, when we compromise, when we put ourselves around the wrong people. And I know for many of us who go, I would never do that. But the Bible gives this great illustration. Here's Abraham's life, a man who didn't do it perfectly, who messed up at different times, but in faith followed God and trusted him. And here's Lot, who if I think correctly, there's not one time in the scriptures that I see him talking with God, asking him what he should do. And do you see the difference? God's saying, Abraham's life is the example. Lot's is what you don't want. And my question is, if our decisions really write our legacy, what's the legacy that you're leaving? Because it's not about what you want to leave. It's about what you do. Even a child is known by their doing. If you want to be a a dad that loved their kids, then we say, you know what? I demonstrated that by my actions and my behaviors. You want to be somebody in the community that makes a difference for the kingdom of God? Then we should demonstrate that by our actions and our decisions. What is it that you want to be known for? Because our our decisions write our legacy, not what we want. It's what we do. And my heartbeat for each one of us is, I don't want you to have Lot's story. I want you to have a story that, man, I was sold out for the king of all kings. I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and it wasn't about just on the side, this kind of thing, that I'm a Christian till the end of my days, hoping I I lived it out to the full. I trusted him in the decisions that I made for my life. When I even didn't feel like it, I knew God's way was better because he's infinitely wiser than I am. I trusted him in all of these things, and look at what God did through my life, and look at what God did, and look at how he's blessed my kids, and look at the things that I've got in this marriage. Because if you want to have a great marriage and that's what you want to be known for, then be a great husband and be a great wife. Can I be honest with you? 
There's so many people that I, 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 I struggle with when I hear these words of, oh, yeah, I cuss at my spouse all the time. We drop the F word at each other all the time. I'm like, what? I swear at my kids. I yell at them all the time. What? Is that the culture that you want? May be more importantly, is that the legacy you want to leave? Because our, our decisions write the pages of our legacy. And I just want to say all this as a warning because I love you and I care about you to get on track with God's plan for your life rather than your own. The last thing I want to close with is this. How I finish is more important than how I begin. And I want to give you hope this morning. There's a warning in that and an encouragement. How you finish is more important than how you begin. Why? Because you look at Lot's life. He's blessed. He's got all the livestock. He's got herdsmen. He's got so much that he and Abraham have to split company because he's got so much blessing from God. And look at how he ended. And just because you're here today and you started as a Christian doesn't mean you're finishing well. The encouragement that I want to share with you is this. Just because you started poorly doesn't mean that that's the way you have to finish your life out. That God is a redeeming God and he has a purpose and a plan for your life. And maybe today is a day of the final decision to say, you know what, I'm tired of running my life my way like Lot and I want to give my life to Christ and have him turn my life around so that I leave a lasting legacy that I'm proud of, that impacts my kids, that impacts my neighbors, that impacts my community. That it is something that is of value, that's changing people's lives for the positive. Because how you start doesn't have to be the end of your story today. You might say, I've committed adultery. You might say, I've, I've been an addict. You might say, I've been a slanderer of people. I have no idea what it is in your life, but that doesn't have to be the end of your story. As a matter of fact, it's one of the things that I struggle with a little bit with AA because I want to tell you the difference. With Alcoholics Anonymous, you come in, you say, hey, my name is Brian and I'm an alcoholic. I want to tell you this. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you come in, you say, I am a child of God and my life has been transformed. I'm a brand new creation in Jesus Christ. He has taken the old away and behold, all things have become new. And he can do that in your life today. And so I just want to conclude by talking to a couple of people right now. One is there's probably some of you right now that are thinking these words. You know what? There's somebody in my life that could really use this message, Brian. Oh, yeah. And you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. There's somebody in my life that could really use this message. You know who it is? You. It's you. It's you. Turn to somebody right now and say, this was for you. Just tell them that. This was for you. Because it was. And I want to tell you that some of you are here today and you've been a Christian for a long time. You go, I would never do stuff like that. But there are all sorts of compromises in your life if you're being honest. And I want to tell you these words because the Apostle Paul said them. Be careful how you stand lest you fall. Because the moment that we think we would never do something is one of the, one of the most vulnerable places you can be in your life. It's not just for everybody else. It's for you. Some of you are here today and you're on the verge of making some compromises, maybe in a dating relationship. Well, they're not a Christian, and I know God says this. Well, we're going to move into sexuality when God says this. Man, we're going to be drinking a little bit more than we should when God says this. Can I encourage you? Would you make the decision right now? You are at a crossroads to say, I'm not going to do what Lot did. I'm going to stand on God's truth. I'm going to build my house the way he told me to build the house, like a wise builder who, who, who not only knows the word of God, but puts it into practice. And when God says it, that settles it because he knows better than I do. Would you say no compromise today? Oh, oh thank you. You said it. Oh, that was good. I didn't mean it like that, but that's incredible. Is that all it takes? So um, the second thing is some of you have already made that compromise, and you know it. Maybe you're a lot further down the road of compromises, and I want to tell you this. Instead of going, trying to find a weasel way out, maybe it's time just to make a U-turn in your life. Maybe it's time to say, I blew it. Maybe it's time to get into community with some people to say, I can't do this alone. I need some help. Get involved in a small group. Find some people around you that really care about you and live this thing out. Some of you have been living in isolation. You've been afraid to tell people about stuff because you're afraid what they're going to think, and you're hijacking your life, you're shipwrecking your life. You're not experiencing the fullness of what God has given for you, wants for you. Maybe today is a day of getting serious in that. And maybe, maybe for some of us here, maybe for you it's the realization that, yeah, my life represents a lot of lot stuff. Maybe, maybe it's not exactly like that. 
But there's a lot of lot. Oh, did you catch that? Yeah, I worked on hours on that. <laughs> there's a lot of lot. There's a lot of lot in you. And instead of getting to this spot of going, ah, maybe it's time today to say, God, I've been doing this alone. I've been messing up my life, and I don't want my story to be like that. I want to give my life to you. Because I'm going to tell you, Jesus Christ came to save you from your sin and to save you from yourself. And he did the same for me. And the reality is there's a lot of lot in all of us. If we're not careful, we start feeding that flesh, going down that road. And when your life gets totally transformed and given over to Christ, he changes stuff. And I want to tell you today, it's the gospel message that every single one of us has sin. We all have the capability of doing wrong things. And the truth of the matter is we've all broken God's law. We do bad things. We've done bad things. We have sinned and we've broken our connection with God. And the Lord knew that you and I could never fix that. So in grace and in his love, just as he saves Lot out of Sodom, who did not deserve it, he sent his son for you and me. And certainly, I'm going to tell you this, I did not deserve it. But he sent his son so that I could have a relationship with him. And the only difference between some of us in this room and me is that I've put my faith in him as my Lord and my Savior. And, and he's the one who has made me right with God. And my hope and prayer is that you have that experience too and you can cling to that. And if you've never done that in just a moment, I'm going to say a prayer where you can do that for the very first time today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Father, I thank you for a message and a truth that is not an easy one to hear. But Lord, we trust that you put it there in your word for a reason. And God, I pray and I got to believe that there may be a reason that you have brought some of us here today to hear that very message. Lord, I pray for some of us who are on the verge of making some compromising decisions in our life that we think are small and insignificant. But God, to you, they're important. And they're one step in a series of steps that may lead us to a journey and a destination that we don't want to be at. I pray I pray, Lord, that you would intervene. I pray that we would be submitted to you. Lord, I pray for some of us in this room that we've already made some decisions. We're headed down a road, and the reality is we've, we've gotten to a place where we've gotten off track. We know it, that today would be a day of U-turns. Today would be a day of a new direction, turning back to you and maybe getting away from being isolated and getting back into community once again. Father, I pray for those of us here who maybe think we've gone way too far down the road. And that you would give us hope. That there would be encouragement that you are a life-changing God, a redeeming God, a reconciling God. And if we've still got breath in our lungs, you've still got a purpose for our life, and we can cling to that today. And if you're here right now, and honestly, for the maybe very first time in your life, you think to yourself, I... I don't want to live my life without God in it anymore. And I don't want to end up like Lot or even end up where I'm heading. And you say, today is a day that you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and put your faith in him and call out to him. I would encourage you maybe to say a simple prayer like this in your heart. God, I need you. I know you have great things in store for me. And I've been doing things my own way. I want to turn from my sin today and turn to you. Jesus, I believe you died for me. You gave your life for me. And I believe that. Would you come into my life? Would you forgive me? Would you give me a brand new start today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.